Hi everybody and welcome to Out of the Gate, Daily Racing Forum's weekend handicapping preview program. I'm Dan Ullman. Thanks so much for watching. Here's what's coming up in this week's edition of Out of the Gate. Graded stakes, Breeders' Cup prep races galore, coast to coast, Out of the Gate has you covered. DRF handicappers Matt Bernier, Mike Beer and I will take a look at the Grade 1 Awesome Again stakes and the Grade 1 Front Runner stakes at Santa Anita, as well as the Grade 1 Joe Hirsch Turf Classic from beautiful Belmont Park. Nicole Russo's Pedigree Picks segment will focus on the two Grade 1 stakes races for two-year-olds in Southern California. Craig Milkowski of Timeform U.S. spotlights the Grade 1 Vosburg Stakes for Sprinters at Belmont Park. J.K.'s Play of the Day features a juicy Belmont Pick 4 sequence, plus best bets, horses to watch, and lots, lots more. So let's break out of the gate. We begin out of the gate as we do each and every week with our horse watch segment. Mike Beer, Naira analyst. You've got a horse from Belmont Park that made your DRF.com horse watch list. Yeah, last Friday at uh, Belmont Park, early on the card, race number four is a New York bred maiden special weight on the grass. Take a look at uh, Jody's song. She is a New York bred on paper only by Scat Daddy out of a Spites Town mare. They paid 250000 for her. And uh, she wins as she pleases here. She looked like this all the way around the track, though, guys. She drew in off the AE list, and she never was asked to get out of a gallop in this race. This was a very, very impressive debut win for this horse. I'd be very interested to see where she turns up next. Wow, that's what's known as gear down under the wire. The jock is still as a statue as Jody Song canters home. Matt, You've got one of the fastest two-year-olds in the country, and I have a feeling a lot of folks still have yet to hear of this horse. This is the latest Canterbury Flash. This is Amy's Challenge. Her most recent start was against the boys. Both of her lifetime starts, actually, against the boys. This is in the Shakopee Juvenile. And you see on the outside, Mr. Jägermeister. Now, maybe this is a little bit of a disappointing effort from him, hanging on his left lead. He's finally going to change late, but at this point, he's in deep water. Amy's Challenge is going to battle back on the inside. Like you had said, Dan, this might be the fastest two-year-old no one's talking about. She's only earned 92 and 91 buyers. Timeform U.S. ratings, both north of 115. I haven't seen her do anything wrong. The big thing now is going to be we'll find out how good she actually is. It sounds like the connections are pointing toward the Alcibiades at Keeneland. That'll be a two-turn race where she will get the distance and class test. I have a promising three-year-old sprinter I'd like to spotlight in this week's Horse Watch segment. It's American Pastime. Let's take a look at the Gallant Bob Stakes last week. Breaking out of the gate, this horse is the number five, and American Pastime just took like a little stutter step coming out of the gate and ends up a little bit farther behind than I think he wants to be. Wide on the turn, turning into the stretch, he attacks Colfront, who ends up winning this race with a big buyer speed figure. Unfortunately, Colfront injured after this race, his racing career in jeopardy. But American Pastime put up a big number. Now, whether the connections have decided that this race is enough to go into the Breeders' Cup sprint, that's another thing completely. But doesn't a race like the Malibu opening day of the Winter Santa Anita meeting for three-year-old sprinters going seven furlong just figure to work right in American Pastime's favor? He's a horse that's always had a little bit of hype around him. It looks like he is finally living up to his potential. That's American Pastime, a three-year-old sprinter based in Southern California. Let's get to some handicapping. Great racing action this week. We'll begin with the awesome again. Let's take a look at the field for the DRF.com Formulator Race of the Day on Saturday. It's the Grade 1 Awesome Again Stakes, one of five graded stakes races at Santa Anita on Saturday. This one carded as race number 10 for expanded stakes previews of many of the graded stakes races this weekend. Head on over to video.drf.com and for free Formulator Pass performances of the Awesome Again Stakes, visit the Race of the Day event page on DRF. Dot com. Gentlemen, it looks like the number two Dortmund will be scratched. The one win the space. His participation questionable. He's also cross-centered in the graded stakes race on turf at Santa Anita on Sunday. The John Henry, Bob Baffert, we all know about his strong hand already in the handicap division. He has two in here, including the morning line favorite. That is Cupid. Matt, let's go back to the Gold Cup at Santa Anita. This horse is already a grade one stakes winner at Santa Anita. And he's learned to relax this year off of the pace. Yeah, he did. He came off the pace this day, whereas Last year as a three-year-old, he did his best running out there on the front end. You see how long it takes him to change leads. This is just kind of him. He's always been his own worst enemy. Consider this race was off, what, eight, nine-month layoff, something crazy like that, at a mile and a quarter. Baffert had said, ah, he may need one. Well, guess what? He looked just fine there. It's also worth noting, though, that field hasn't come back all that strong 
maybe he just took advantage of the absolute perfect situation in the Gold Cup. You really did get a very nice trip tracking a pretty hot pace battle, Mike. What do you think of Cupid overall as a horse? What do you think of this overall field? I mean, there are question marks galore. Yeah, that, that's very true. I don't think that much of the field, to be perfectly honest with you. I've never been Cupid's biggest fan either. Um, I sort of recognize him, though, as the horse to beat in this race, if only because of the race we just watched, where he got the big 108 buyer speed figure. I know in his start subsequent to that, his second start of the year, you know, I guess for a two to five favorite, you know, maybe you wanted to see him be a little bit a little bit more dominant than he was in that race. You know, on the other hand, when I watched it anyway, never looked like he was going to lose that race. I feel like he's just way the horse to beat in here. He's the horse to beat, but we'll take a shot against him. He will be a short price. Matt, make a case for a horse I've tried to make a case for for a long time, and I'm done. I'm at the point now with Donworth anyway, where I kind of feel like maybe the equipment change coming into this race is really going to be the difference maker. They're going to add blinkers for the first time in his career. And I feel like his run two starts back in the San Diego handicap down at Del Mar, which we're going to take a look at right now, was actually... I don't want to say a winning race because obviously he got buried by Accelerate, but Accelerate's not in this field. And the most recent start, draw a line through it. He's never going to beat Accelerate or Collected or Arrowgate. But in this spot, he finishes ahead of a couple of decent enough horses. He's always hinted that there might be something there. I understand he's much more sizzled than steak. You add the blinkers, maybe that sharpens him up a little bit. If I have questions about everyone in this field, why wouldn't I shop around for a price with a horse that maybe we still haven't seen what he's capable of? Mike, you're going to go with a horse that I think on paper is the one that Cupid's going to fear the most. Yeah, I think so. We'll see what happens with Breaking Lucky. I guess the real problem with Breaking Lucky is, you know, he's 3 for 21 lifetime. He never seems to win. He's 1 for 12 lifetime on dirt. So we'll see. But he's just run, to me anyway, plenty of races that would make him really competitive in a race like this one. we got to go way back uh, to get this replay of a race where he actually, you know, ran pretty well in here. This is um, at the end of 2016. He runs well to be second to gun runner in this race. This is a horse who, um, when he near, he almost won the wood, the grade one Woodward in September of 2016. Part of that four horse photo in that race. And I thought he ran really well that day. He has run five times on fast dirt since that race. Three of them against gun runner, one against Arrogate in the Pegasus World Cup, and the only other one in the New Orleans Handicap earlier this April where he didn't win, but he was best in that race, dueling a really fast pace and then only getting closed down on the wire. I don't like anybody who's been campaigning in Southern California heading into this race. I'll take the new face. He tried hard in that Clark against Gunrunner, and boy, if anything, just to get away from Gunrunner, maybe that's all it needs for Breaking Lucky to get to the winner's circle. My top selection in here is more sort of a value spot play than a confident top selection. That's Curlin' Rules. We're going to go back to the Harry F. Brubaker stakes in a moment where he wasn't beating Cupid. Cupid handled him as the favorite, but I thought Curlin' Rules dug in very gamely once Cupid went by. I mean, he really never got a breather in this race. Curlin Rules took up the chasing spot behind Soy Fett, who we see sort of floundering in third. And when he made his move, Cupid was right on top of him. Cupid has passed him. Curlin Rules is never getting him. But I like the way that Curlin Rules is really trying and digging down towards the inside. This is a horse that has improved in recent starts. Blinkers have come on recently for John Sadler. And Cupid's going to be something like 2-1 to one in this race. I wouldn't be surprised if Curlin Rules is 8-1. to one. And I don't think there's that much separating them, only three-quarters of a length separating them at the wire and the Harry F. Brubaker stakes. So we'll look for some value to try to beat Cupid in the grade one awesome again. Nicole Russo's pedigree pick segment is coming up next. She's going to focus on two grade one stakes races for two-year-olds pedigree, a very important handicapping angle. Hi, guys. Nicole Russo coming to you from Lexington, Kentucky for Out of the Gate. Well, there are two grade one events for juveniles on Saturday at Santa Anita. And is as is often the case with two-year-olds, you've got young horses trying new things in both. Let's take a look first at the grade one front runner for the boys, which is led by grade one Delmar Futurity winner Bolt de Oro, going beyond seven furlongs and getting his two-turn test for the first time. Now, Bolt Doro, who you're watching here win the Futurity, is by Medallia Doro, sire of a pair of Kentucky Oaks winners and Hall of Famer Rachel Alexandra and Plum Pretty, also the sire of two-time Eclipse champion Songbird. He can definitely get you a two-turn horse. Bolt Doro is out of, of the AP Indy mare Globetrot. Posted all three of her career wins at a mile on Synthetic. She's also the dam of Sonic Mule, a stakes winner at a mile. It's the family of grade one winning sprinters, Zensational. 
So this might be more of a sprint to middle distance female family, but pairing that with Medaglia Doro on the top, I think this kind of middle distance of a mile and a 16th should be well within Bull Doro's scope. Now, the distance isn't the question for encumbered, it's the surface. Lost his career debut on the Santa Anita main track in stakes company. Now has won two at a mile on turf, including the Del Mar Juvenile Turf. Was it a debut mulligan or does he not like the dirt? He's from the first crop of Violence, who already has stakes performers on both dirt and turf. Violence is a son of Medaglia Doro, who is really versatile. He gets grade one winners on dirt like the Phillies we just highlighted and on turf such as marketing mix. Broodmare Sire Street Cry, a really similar type of stallion who gets top-level performers on all surfaces. Encumbered has two winning half-siblings, one of those on the dirt and one of those on the turf. I think Encumbered might prefer the turf. That being said, there's so much versatility in the family that I think this merits a try now that he's got more experience. See if that dirt debut was a fluke. Let's quickly move on and take a look at Saturday's grade one chandelier for the two-year-old Phillies. The favorite will be Moonshine Memories, unbeaten in two starts, including the grade one Del Mar debutante. She's also getting her two-turn test here. She's by Malibu Moon, of course, a classic sire from that stamina-producing AP Indie line, and he's crossed well with this female family. Her damn unenchanted evening, a half-sister to champion favorite trick, one at a mile. Most of her foals have been good sprinters, including Indian Evening, a stakes winner at seven furlongs. The exception in the group is Stevie's Moonshot by Malibu Moon, making him a full brother to this one, a winner at a mile and a 16th. Broodmare Sire Unbridled Song is represented in that category by classic placed Metal Count and Cherry Wine, two turn grade one winners like Carpe Diem, General Quarters. Also, the Broodmare Sire of the multiple graded winning Feral by Malibu Moon on the same cross. So, Moonshine Memory is another one where I think the added distance will be no problem. Major grade one action at Santa Anita and Belmont on Saturday. We'll have more on the latter track on Out of the Gate after these messages. We listen. DRF Plus has more flexible subscription options. Use DRF Plus Basic for exclusive news and analysis, including our DRF Live real time news feed. Or go deeper with DRF Pro and unlock buyers, closer looks, picks, and reports, including the DRF Daily Game Plan. DRF TV viewers get 50% off the plan of your choice. Use code DRFTV50 at checkout. Learn more about the DRF Plus subscription plans at drf.com forward slash plus. Welcome back to Out of the Gate. Let's take a look at the field for one of three grade one stakes races at Belmont Park on Saturday. This, the $500,000 Joe Hirsch Turf Classic at a mile and a half. For expanded stakes previews, visit video.drf.com. We've got the best three-year-old turf force in the country, the number three Oscar performance. The morning line favorite in the Joe Hirsch Turf Classic, trying older horses for the first time. Mike Beer, he's got that easy cruising speed. He can go to the lead he can sit second can he get a mile and a half I guess we'll find out on Saturday if he can get the mile and a half and if he can get it as he steps up to face some really tough older horses here he's coming in off a pair of you know grade one victories going a mile and a quarter um, including one over this turf course um, at Belmont Park I mean he ran really well in that Belmont Derby we got the replay of that race that we can look at I mean he just sort of walked on the lead in this race and took advantage in the stretch he was really impressive um, I guess the questions now are can he get the mile and a half can he get it against some better horses and can he get it in a race where he might actually take 
take some pressure up on the lead, all those things perhaps working against him, decide what kind of price you want on him because he's the morning line favorite. Matt, after dominating this field in the Belmont Derby, he shipped to Arlington Park. He ran in the grade one secretariat stakes. Now, let's be honest, it was not the strongest field of three-year-olds he beat in the secretariat, but he did it in a faster time than the older horses in the Arlington Million ran later on the card. He's a legitimate horse. Yeah, he really is, and I think, you know, I can only speak for myself, but I know it's taken a long time for me to fully buy into this horse, and I'd be lying if I said I wasn't fully buying into him. Now, the only problem is in a race like this, like Mike alluded to, he's going to have to probably take a little bit of heat up early on, and you look at it strictly from a buyer's standpoint, from buyers, he is really, really light right now. He's going to need to run the race of his life, and not by a little bit, by a significant margin, if he's going to win this race on Saturday. A horse coming out of the Arlington Million is Mechtal, a Group 1 winner in France. Now, he's going to try the mile and a half. It's a bit of an unknown for him, but he's got that pedigree that indicates that, boy, the longer the better, Mike. Yeah, I think the mile and a half should be okay for him. I mean, it's a little bit of an unknown. He tried it once over there. He ran fine in that race with a little bit of trouble in the stretch. I think the distance is fine for him. If he start going through his PPs, especially in France, Firm turf seems to uh, really help this horse. Um, we have a positive trainer staff for Grand Motion. This is going to be his first start for Grand Motion, and this is just something that you know Motion does really well, taking over the training of these horses, adding Lasix, um, especially on grass. They seem to win. They're generally good prices. And the, to me, this was the horse you wanted out of the Arlington Million. I know Matt and I agree on this. I'll let him expand on the trip. I thought this horse got a terrible trip and ride in that race and ran way better than it looks. I think that's a very good point. The horses that sort of ran one, two, three in the Arlington Million, he might have benefited from extremely good trips. This horse, he was sort of bottled up a little bit. Yeah, he was. And he also factored in. There wasn't a ton of pace signed on early. He was in toward the back of the pack, in behind horses. And Frankie never really had an opportunity to get him out into the clear and let him run. Whether he would have won or at least threatened for it, I don't really know. But I know he probably is better than what we saw there that day. It's also worth noting. I mean, he was bet that day. He was down to 5 or 6 to 1. I mean, how foolish would we all feel if we let a horse that came over here from Europe to run in a race like the Million? He went off at of five to one, had a bit of a troubled trip, and all of a sudden he comes back and pays twenty dollars in a race like this. He's just the kind of horse for me that I have enough questions about everybody else. I'll take a shot with him because I don't think we've seen his best yet. I'll go with the Million winner, the hard trying Beach Patrol. He's got good tactical speed, and I think he's going to be sitting in a very nice spot, second off of Oscar performance in the early stages of this race. Now, a mile and a half is a question mark for Beach Patrol as well. I just have a feeling that he's going to try to sink his teeth into Oscar performance as they enter the far turn and maybe try to gut it out because that's really Beach Patrol's game. Let's go back to his race two starts back in the United Nations at Mount. He hasn't won this race, but he has been on the lead throughout. And just look at these fractions for a long distance race 23 and 1. 46 and 4, battling throughout with the quality Southern California based runner. It's in the post, and he digs in so gamely to finish third behind a couple of closers. And in the Arlington Million, you know, he was up on the pace. He dug in in the stretch. DeVee got to jump on him late, and he was able to just grind it out. And I'm hoping that maybe we get a similar situation from Beach Patrol, a horse that consistently buyers in the triple digit range for trainer. Chad Brown. Let's move to Southern California for some two-year-olds prepping for the Breeders' Cup Juvenile in the Front Runner Stakes. We move back to Santa Anita for the Grade One Front Runner Stakes for two-year-olds. Let's take a look at this field. We've got nine entered for the $300,000 prep for the Breeders' Cup Juvenile at a mile and a sixteenth. For expanded stakes previews of most of the graded stakes all weekend long, head on over to video.drf.com. The two morning line favorites, the four, Bolt Dioro, the number one, Zadder, they exit the grade one Delmar Futurity. Let's start talking about Bolt Dioro, Matt. Two for two, he's used variety of running styles. He's a very professional, nice horse that seems to finish off his races. Yeah, he really is. He's a nice horse. That's about all you can say right now. He's very, very fast. He's shown that he can win outright on the lead. And as he showed in the futurity, he can overcome a little bit of a, an issue. He didn't get out of the gate the cleanest. And you see him rolling up on the outside now. Uh, to me, it, it's one of the biggest feathers in a two-year-old's cap that they can show multi-dimensions. And at this point, I don't know if he's ultimately going to be a horse that wants to be forward or come from off the pace, but it's nice to know he can do both. Meanwhile, Zadar ran a giant race in this spot, too. I like that he sat and he finished a little bit. Both the just ran him down a little bit. I think they're both major players. Mike Zadar has also been rumored to perhaps scratch out of the front runner and run in the Champagne at Belmont. So, folks, please pay attention to the late changes at Santa Anita on Saturday. I thought Zadar ran really well in the Del Mar Futurity. He got the jump on Bolt Dioro, but he sort of made his move into the teeth of the pace. Yeah, he moved a little bit earlier than 
than that horse, and he stayed pretty gamely through the stretch. You saw on the replay there, he wasn't really giving it up at the end. Um, you know, we'll see what happens. He's got to stretch out in distance here, which I guess could be a little bit of a problem for him, but he just, to me anyway, based on his first two starts, he's a very forward two-year-old. He's got a lot of things going for him. He's got speed. He's got a good post on the rail. If he's going to stretch out effectively, this might be the spot where you see him do it. Matt, you don't have really any worries about two turns with your top selection in this race. A very professional winner most recently. Tell us about Ayakara. Ayakara needs to run faster. Let's get that out of the way first and foremost. The distance, you're right, not going to be any sort of an issue where maybe it is for some of these other horses, but Ayakara is a little bit slow on buyers, and he's really slow on time form ratings. But if you go back and look at his most recent race, this was his maiden score in his second lifetime start. This is a horse that is always sort of hinted, even going back to the debut, that he wants more distance. And you see him splitting horses right now. That's not the most comfortable trip for a two-year-old making his second lifetime start. I like the way that he goes on with it. I understand maybe it looks like it's a little bit of a stagger fest here at the end. But he gives off the indication to me anyway that he wants distance. Keith DeSormo, keep in mind, he doesn't have him cranked up first out, and he really doesn't have him cranked up second out either. I think this is a horse that as the distances get longer, it'll only be beneficial. And maybe that's something that he already has in his corner that the others don't. Distance, certainly not an issue. And pace might not be an issue as well with a lot of these stretch out sprinters. There should be a good pace to set things up for Ayakara. Mike, you like Bob Baffert's other runner in here, Solo Mean. He wasn't bet like another runner in his debut. <laughs> Hammered in his debut. He got it done. A little bit green still. Yeah, that's what I thought. He was He was very green. Almost to me looked like, even though he eventually winds up um, getting it done in this race and prevailing, he to me looked like a horse who really could benefit from that first run. He was very green in this race. Here he comes um, on the outside here um, after the pace setter in the race. And he's... You know, you could tell he's always going to get get by this horse in the stretch. It just takes him a while to do it. He's on his wrong lead for a lot of the way here. Um, I thought this was a, a, a debut that he could really build upon. The other Baffert horse may be a more likely win this race. He's certainly a more forward and professional horse. But I think this horse could really take a step forward. To me, this is the longer-term prospect that I want. I think he might benefit from stretching out, too. I mentioned in the expanded stakes previews that uh, Matt and I did for the front runner that I wonder if my top selection in here, Texas Wedge, is a little bit of a trap. From purely a buyer speed figure standpoint, he's the fastest horse in the race. I think it was an 86 buyer speed figure first time out early in the Del Mar meeting. We're going to take a look at that race right now where this horse is driving to the front right now and the jock never eases up. He says, let's keep on rolling here and Texas Wedge complies. He is strong in the stretch drawing off to win. Now there's always a but and the but in this spot is that he's only beating maiden claiming competition. So not only is Texas Wedge stretching out considerably in distance from five and a half furlongs to a mile and a sixteenth, but he is stepping way up in class. But I just like the way he won this race, and I wonder that even with that fast buyer speed figure and good connections in his corner, if he can't help but being a playable price, simply because he's stepping up in class. That's the number six, Texas Wedge, in the front runner stakes. JK's play of the day, a pick four sequence at Belmont Park, and then Craig Milkowski of Timeform US profiles the Vosburg stakes. Let's hit those segments right now. Hey everybody, welcome to JK's Play of the Day. Uh, last week, we, we missed in the last leg. Hopefully you were smart enough to use West Coast. I wasn't. Uh, turned out he's going to be a pretty good three-year-old. IRAP ran well, but we wish him a speedy recovery. On to Belmont for the late pick four, starting in race seven. Uh, I got an eight-to-one shot single here. Um, it's going to be uh, you know a single, a single A ticket. I'm going to use a couple of backups here. But I think Stall Walking Dude is set for a really big performance in here. I think Stall Walking Dude has always excelled going six furlongs. He's run well at Belmont. He's a four-time winner at Belmont, a 12-time winner going six furlongs. He's going to cut back in distance a little bit from the seven he ran at last time. He's going to have plenty of speed uh, to run in front of him here. He's going to save ground from the inside. And I think Stall Walking Dude's going to mow him down late. That's where I find the value in this pick four. However... I am going to use the two, the four, and the five as B-horses, El Deal, Tockeful, and Mr. Crow. Uh, I thought all three of those horses ran really well in their last starts. Um, yeah, they're all fast. For whatever reason, if one or two of them takes back and the pace doesn't materialize the way that I would predict that it will, I do think that one of those horses could win loose on the lead. However, there's three speeds. If two of them go, I think it sets up perfectly for stall walk and dude. That will be my lone A in the first leg of the pick four. In the second leg of the pick four, uh, I, you know, I, the pilgrim, the two-year-old pilgrim, I didn't have as strong as his opinion here. I'm going to use the four, uh, uh, Sabak, um, for Todd Pletcher, the five, voting control. 
and um, uh, the eight evaluator. Evaluator got bet pretty heavy last time. Missed the break, was wide all the way around there, didn't have a great shot. Voting control uh, ran huge last time. Uh, the word was out on that one. Uh, the, the, the price was a little bit larger, but uh, uh, the, the word was out that he was going to run well. Uh, no strong opinion here. Just going to try to make it through this leg using those three horses. Uh, the value, like I said, falls in the first leg. In the third leg of the pick four, uh, you know, I, I wanted to try to get creative here, but it just feels like a late's going to be tough. Uh, Bill Mott has her going in the right direction. I thought the mile and a quarter last time uh, was exactly what she wanted in the Alabama. However, I don't think the mile and eight is going to be a problem. It's a long run to the first turn. She should be able to, to, to get position moving forward from that inside draw and, and should be able to outfinish these uh, the rest of the way. Uh, the only concern, I guess, would be is that uh, this is a grade one, but it's still, you feel like this isn't the goal. The goal is probably the Breeders' Cup this staff, um, but I don't see a reason that, to lay off of, uh, off of this horse here for, for Bill Mott. I think she'll be running forward in this spot, and I just really couldn't find anything else to have my attention in there. So I'm going to single a late as a single A horse, and then the last leg, I'm just going to hope to be alive here. I'm going to use a ton of horses. A lot of horses demand respect in this one. I'm going to use the one, the three, the four, the five, the six, and the nine. The one money multiplier. Uh, I did not like the horse last time and ran well. I've talked about it on the podcast before. When I fade a horse and they run through my my fading, it's definitely got my attention next time. Um, the three Oscar performance, a uh, three-year-old uh, that's been running really well this year, and I think that uh, this horse is, is one that could be dangerous. He showed his ability to go longer at a mile and a quarter. Uh, you know, speed horses. Uh, are the, the horses that I want stretching out. Uh, he's going to be loose on the front end, could be tough to run down late. His trainer is no slouch as well. Sadler's Joy moved early, two races back at Saratoga, got it done last time in the Sword Dancer. Uh, he's one that I think is dangerous. Beach Patrol, our Arlington Million winner, didn't really like him that day. The pace wasn't exactly fast that day, but he's definitely one that I respect for Chad Brown. Asin closed into that slow pace in the, in the uh, Arlington Million. He's one that I'm going to use. Uh, the, the horse second time, uh, us for Chad, um, you would assume that Chad was probably the one that saddled the horse in the Arlington million, but now has had him under his care. Um, and I think that that horse could run well as well. So I'm pretty much using a lot in this spot. Uh, but like I said, the value in this bet is in the first leg with, uh, stall walk and do good luck. We'll see you next week. Hi, I'm Craig Mokowski, chief speed figure analyst for time form us for this week's edition of out of the gate. Uh, today, I'm going to look at the grade one Vosburg Stakes being run at six furlongs for three-year-olds and up at Belmont Park this Saturday. Uh, first, I want to look at the Timeform US preview page. We have this for all races, and it's a dynamic page as opposed to static. Stuff does change and get updated as time goes on. You can see I took this last night, and it shows there's still 65 hours to post. Uh, there's no morning line. And the underline where the NA is where, where you would see the track condition. So all those things will get updated as we get closer to post time. Uh, a few of the things I take note of on the preview page are uh, the spotlight figures, in particular who has the highest one, and kind of compare horses to those. And then also who has uh, the best early speed and late speed rating. Uh, the early speed rating is what you're going to see on the Timeform US pace projector, just in a bra graphical presentation. And uh, you can see that there's a small version of it in the upper right corner on the preview page, and you just click on that, and it explodes into a bigger, more detailed uh, pace projector, so which we're going to take a look at now. Uh, the pace projector doesn't show. This is where you would see if uh, it thought maybe it was going to be a hot pace or if it was going to favor horses on or near the early lead. In this case, the algorithm that we use didn't p uh, pick one of these options. But this is a race I think is going to be a hot pace, and we'll look at some of the horses now to see why. Uh, the horse shown on the lead is El Deal. Uh, he's kind of the now horse right now. Uh, he won the grade one Vanderbilt last out, just blew the field away at Saratoga with a 131 time form U.S. speed figure. Uh, that's where the, his spotlight rating came from. And it was, it's the best in the field. Uh, he's, he's been on a tear since claimed by trainer Jorge Navarro. And uh, just been on fire. But a, a few things to note, he's definitely going to face some other speed in here, I think, as we'll see. And both of his last wins at, at bigger tracks, his first win came at Charlestown for his new connections, have come over tracks we have labeled as uh, highly speed favoring, which you can see where the race rating is circled in red. 
So while he'll probably be the favorite in here, he's a horse I'm I'm going to take a shot against. Another horse we have uh, shown next in the pace projector is three-year-old Tackaful. Uh, he's a horse who who was put on the triple crown cra- uh, triple crown trail after some uh, after a good early debut. He won sprinting and he got stretched out, but he just had no success whatsoever routing. Uh, he was given a layoff and brought back in sprints, and he's been really good. And I think uh, he's found what his niche is in this game. Uh, he's definitely a sprinter. Uh, he ran second last out at Saratoga in a grade one. Before that, he won an allowance race really easy. But what really sticks out last time is his high speed. I mean, a 165 pace figure for the opening quarter mile, uh, 141 to the half. You can see those noted in red as being extremely fast. Uh, and that was after a bit of a, not not the cleanest of breaks. Uh, he lost to Practical Joke, but did hold on gamely for second. Practical Joke's a horse who's still undefeated around one turn. Uh, and is headed to the Breeders' Cup. I'm not sure which race yet. I don't think that's been decided. But he actually was given a better time form U.S. speed figure because of that paced and practical joke was. Uh, a horse I'm not going to get into too much, but is shown next in the price projector is Green Grotto. I really don't think he's a contender here. Uh, he seems to be a horse that loves Aqueduct. Maybe when they go back to Aqueduct, he'll he'll fare better. But he is a horse who has high early speed and will almost surely be a pace factor. Uh, yet another horse uh, that's shown a lot of early speed is Mr. Crow. He comes from the Todd Pletcher barn, and he's trying stakes company for the first time off some really good runs. I, he had a tough break, uh, a little bit of a trouble trip first time out, didn't win, but then he just exploded with two big wins at Saratoga, breaking his maiden by over 11 lengths and then crushing an allowance field by six. Uh, we do show some of his fractions in blue, saying the pace was slow. But it's a little deceiving in this case because the pace is only slow because he himself finished so fast to get high uh, speed figures at the end. Like last time he ran a 128 at the wire, was only 123 after the half. So we say it was a little on the slow side. But like I said, that is a little bit deceiving. Uh, but he is a horse who I think you have to take a shot against in here. His 125 time form U.S. speed figure certainly fits, but he's never faced the kind of pace he's going to see in here. I don't think he has to be on the lead, but he's going to be close up. And it, it could be a little tough first time. He's a very talented horse, but at the short odds, I'm willing to take a shot against. Uh, the horse I ultimately landed on is Stall Walking Dude, who, who's a horse for a long time I almost always go against in these grade one races because he just he seems to, to beat up on lesser competition, but he doesn't come through at the grade one level. But if he's ever going to do it, I think this is the day. Uh, last time against champion sprinter Drafong, uh, he got stuck in the en- unenviable position of being the chaser of a lone speed horse. And that's a spot he just really doesn't want to be. I mean, he was only a length behind him with a 142 in a race with a 142 or opening quarter. I guess somebody had to do it. We actually had him shown second in the pace projector, which shows you how little early speed there was. So I'm willing to just put a line through that race. And there's a few other things I like. He just seems to be a horse that's better at six than seven furlongs lately. You can see his 124 and 125 time form U.S. speed figures at six. And uh, he only ran one, 115 and 111 at seven furlongs. And the other thing to note is this is the third year in a row that he's running this race. And he's a horse that's run very well in the Vosburg. Back in uh, 2016, he finished a good second behind Joking. And in 2015... He actually made the lead over a speed bias track before getting caught late to lose by only a neck. So I think he's going to revert to his closing running style here. I think the price is going to be right, and I'm going to take a shot with Saul Walking Dude. Uh, that's it for Time Form US this week. Now let's head back to Dan in the studio. Time for our Best Bet segment. Mike Beer, Naira Analyst, you're going to the, the Maryland Jockey Club. <laughs> Yeah, it's the Grade Three Commonwealth Oaks race number seven on Saturday. Laurel, it's a it's a race in Maryland, but it's a New York horse. Flyby is shipping in for Leah Giamatti for her second start off the layoff. Um, we have a replay of her career debut. This is very early in the year down at Gulfstream, switching to the outside right now. She was sort of in and among horses around the turn. She got bumped at the top of the stretch. You'll see her get bumped again as they near the wire, but she's very game here uh, to prevail at the end. She got some time off after this race, returned on September 9th at Belmont Park, and she ran even better in her second career start. She was second best that day at a big price, but she really ran through the stretch, and I 
thought she took a big step forward in that race. And now Lee Germani comes right back three weeks later in a grade three stakes race. This filly has some upside and she'll be a price in this race. Matt, you're going to Southern California, one of the five major grade one stakes races. You're going against one of your favorites. Paradise Woods. Elman, I gotta be honest with you, I don't know why you have me keep doing these best bets because I can't, I couldn't smoke out a best bet to save my life right now. But that's neither here nor there. We're gonna try anyway. The grade one Zenyatta, you're right. I love Paradise Woods. She's gonna be a favorite in here. I wanna take a shot against her with a horse that I've never liked faithfully for Bob Baffert. We're gonna take a look at her run two starts back in the Clement L. Hirsch down at Del Mar. You got big names on the front end. You got Vale Dory and Stellar Wind out there. Faithfully ro rolls up on the outside. And sure, she never actually threatens the top two, but this was far and away the best race of her career. She tries every step of the way. You take those two out of it, it's a winning race, and I understand that's easy to say, but I think this is gonna be a much softer group. You've only got six that are gonna go. Paradise Woods, look, her best race is good enough to beat Faithfully, but I think there's enough pace in there. I think Faithfully is gonna come into this in sneaky good form, and she might actually be a fair enough betting price, two to one, five to two, three to one, based on her recent form. I'll go with Faithfully, take a shot. Hopefully I can get off the schneid here with these silly best bets. My best bet, race number 10 at Delaware Park. It's the number two, Philip Cohen's a piker, who's won four out of her first five starts, but she's been beaten in her last three races. She's finished second in all three of them, but she is not a bridesmaid. She has excuses. Again, she beat three next out winners in that race, four starts back, completely compromised by pace, three starts back, two starts back. She got beat a neck by a very promising sprinter trained by Arno Delacour named Smiling Causeway. And then this race most recently at Delaware Park where the horse on the lead just got away. And this is a very promising undefeated three for three run runner in her own right. Philip Cohen's a piker, more of a mid-pack runner, was forced to take up the chase earlier than she intended in this race. She tries hard, as you see, she is easily second best. She earned a 74 buyer speed figure, which is a little bit light compared to the horse she has to beat, the number one Haley's Flip. But I think Philip Cohen's a piker, a relatively lightly raced three-year-old, has a good amount of upside potential. There should be a fair pace to set her up in here. She's 10 to one on the morning line, which is best of all. I would use her with the one the morning line favorite, Haley's Flip. You can follow us on social media, on Twitter, at DRF Video, at DRF Inside Post. That's it for this week. Best of luck when your horses break out of the gate.